How pro was that new intro? Go ahead, admit it, that was hot. I'm Tim, this is Watchbox Studios, and you are watching Watches Tonight. This evening, we discuss eight top watches to buy this summer for under $10,000. A little bit more on my new watch. We chat live, and I share your viewerist chats tonight on Watches Tonight. Edwards in the box, Joe P, we've got Orto, and we've got Scott, we are underway. Remember to check out the redesigned homepage of thewatchbox.com. There's new watches every single day, and we update multiple times today. It is better than Instagram. You can expect to see new watches every two to three hours. So if you saw it this morning, you're already behind the power curve. Open up a different window, keep me streaming, hit refresh, and watch good things happen. All right, Richard Combs from South Florida, Scott Wexland from Westchester. We've got Joe Pinto from Scotland instead of Louisville this time, so he's watching from Europe. Dave Opencar, Enrique Cassiano, Simon Holt. We've got Akshel joining in from Seattle, and Alan L. along with Nate Meyer, Alexi Simola of Finland and longtime good friend Dylan Lamb. Welcome everyone. Let's start with viewer wrist shots. I asked you answered. We're starting with Dr. Kenny R, who impresses with his Longa One 10127, a standout among Longa's modern watches and an emerging classic. Jeff R of Texas trials his new Alonga Unzona Odysseus in white gold. I always thought the Odysseus looked better on the strap, and this confirms it. Curtis A. is an actual marine naval aviator heading to see Top Gun Maverick with his moon watch. Jonathan S. shines his Mercedes-Benz E200 along with a shiny JLC Polaris Perpetual Calendar, looking good on both counts. Dylan L., he's in the box now, he's on your screen, winning the Pure Photography Award tonight for a triple loom festival fronted by his Air King. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see those pieces on these pixels. We've got a lot of friends, La Aura. We've got Curtis, who's watching from sunny San Diego, my man. That's a military town if ever there were one. We've got Neil Werner from Maryland. We've got Nate Meyer joining in. Okay, guys. So let's talk about eight watches you can buy this summer for under $10,000. If you can't find a watch, by the way, that's a real thing, Salomon P. Chase, if anyone asked you the highest denomination of circulated US currency, it was the $10,000 bill. He was Lincoln's treasury secretary, but I digress. My point is, if you can't find a watch you love for under 10 grand, you aren't looking hard enough. Even in this age of inflation and bubbles, there are plenty of options. You have sufficient budget to own a serious timepiece to suit any taste and without compromise. 10 grand, and we have some grand selections. Starting with the Omega Speedmaster Chronoscope. This is a weird one. I didn't know whether I'd be at peace with it until I got to see it in person. So this came out last year, late last year. Actually, a 2022 launched in late 2021. It feels like a throwback to the wild Omega design experimentation of the late 1990s and 2000s. The dial detail is the highlight of this superb triple scale chronograph. You can get blue on silver or you can get silver on blue. There are even more, but this is the highlight. This is what you're paying for with this watch. High style, very simple, twin register, no date, great looking. This type of dial, the triple scale, is almost unheard of in this price range, and it's rare at any price range. We've seen it on Patek and not a whole lot of other modern watches, to be perfectly honest. At 43 millimeters, and this is where I had my doubts, this is not a small watch, but it is sporty and has an immense character. It is handsome, and its proportions are relatively compact. All of which is to say it looks right from the first glance. Omega seems to have initiated a company-wide movement to make its watches thinner, and that really shows here because this includes a manual wind movement, something Omega is rolling out more and more often. We've seen it, for example, on the Trazors, we've seen it on the Speedmaster 57, on the Aquaterra Ultralight, and now we've seen it on the Chronoscope. And this caliber 9908, you can see it's obviously an adapted version of the 
existing 8900 and 9900 family, but it is thinner and it makes this watch more wearable. And the case bloat in Omega watches has been a 20 year trend. I am glad to see it reversed, even if it means adapting an automatic movement and turning it into a manual wind movement. This whole chronoscope is only 13.2 millimeters thick and it has my seal of approval for fit. Remember I said, Proportionally, it's very handsome. And being super short across the wrist, only about 48 millimeters, even though it's 43, it wears basically like a moon watch and maybe even a little bit slimmer. I do not have a big wrist and I felt like I had clearance on both sides with the lugs of this watch. They were smart about keeping the lugs short and about keeping the bracelet end links pivoted. So this one wears a little bit smaller than its rated size. Several configurations are offered, but go full bracelet in steel and the price is gonna be $8,650, which I think is just fine for the quality that you're getting. These Omega Master chronometers all run within a second a day. That's world-class accuracy. That is far beyond what the COSC requires. It is a good looking watch and significantly it's never going to be confused for a moon watch. It's an Omega chronograph, yes, but it's not another Speedmaster Professional, nor will it ever be mistaken for such. The dials are both expressive and somewhat nostalgic as they look like higher quality versions of vintage dials, and yet the watch is not a vintage re-edition, which I love because vintage re-editions, frankly, are played out. Let's leave that back in the 2000s and the 2010s. The roaring 20s have arrived, and this will be the watch that makes the 20s roar, at least initially, because we move on to a new version of an old watch here. This one isn't a re-edition because it never went away. Like the Porsche 911 or the Mini, it has evolved bit by bit, by and by over the decades. It is the Breitling Navitimer B01 Chronograph 43. Now we have a few different colorful dial versions of this 43 millimeter stainless steel Pilots chronograph this year. Now if you believe Breitling, this is the 70th year of the Navitimer. A lot of very reputable watch historians who've studied this in depth believe the Navitimer actually came out in 1954. The records no longer exist. There is no definitive proof. That said, we're gonna celebrate a nice round number with a watch of commensurately special appeal. This watch right here has the so-called mint dial. Now, Georges Kern, who is the CEO of Breitling, wants you to see tone on tone, that is black on green, and think in-house caliber. Now, they've revived the AOPA wings in all but name. You can see the AOPA shield and wings are there as they would have been on the original Navitimer, which was distributed by and possibly designed for the American Airplane Owners and Pilots Association. So we've got this lovely vintage look for 70 years, but the dial in sunburst green, mint green no less, is redolent of diet spearmint gum and absolutely gorgeous. It's a true sense of occasion. Its loom is actually quite excellent for this type of watches. Not all pilots watches feature a lot of good loom. At 43 millimeters, it is larger than the historic Navitimers, which were typically between 40 and 41 millimeters. But it's a far cry from the monsters of even five years ago at Breitling. Breitling seems to be getting its case size and its lug spans under control, making watches which have always been appealing more more wearable to normal human beings. This mint dial is my favorite. That said, for 2021, several new dial treatments are available. We've got Panda, Inverse Panda, we've got Copper and Blue is Ice Blue. Rolex will have to take a pass on the lawsuit because I don't quite think they've got a case. But if you wondered where that color came from, look no further than Geneva. Uh, this is an awesome trio. There is a 41 millimeter Navitimer series this year. Those are poised more as women's watches, even though historically that is about the size of a traditional Navitimer. Timer. Caliber B01 though in the 43 and the 41 is exactly the same and it's gorgeous in either. This movement was launched in 2009 in the Chronomats and it was not designed for a display case back. Surprisingly, it's actually a pretty good looking caliber. It has everything you would expect. Three day power reserve, column wheel, vertical clutch, chronometer certified, in-house and of course it is good looking, which is no small thing because in the Georges Kern era, Breitling does display case backs. At $9,100, this is not a cheap watch, but Breitling isn't 
asking unreasonable money for the quality of what you're getting and the relevance. Remember, Breitling is selling this as its icon. This is its Moonwatch. This is its Calatrava. This is its Royal Oak and its Reverso. And Sub 10 seems quite fair for the quality of the timepiece received. It's also remarkably colorful. And if I had to guess which green dials are going to stand the test of time between this mint green and last year's Breitling pistachio dial, I would have to say Breitling is currently running the table. What else is going on in the box? We got Abdul saying, hey, Curtis, hope all is well. Thank you for your service, Curtis, and our other veterans who are watching in. We've got a Mick in Florida saying, been grooving on vintage Calatravas lately. Love them. And those 39 Oyster Perpetuals are also awesome. If you like the OP39. Stay tuned, my man. What else is going on? Baltimore Spirits, a brewer after my own heart. We've got Breitling being doing great with dial colors in the last two years. Baltimore Spirits saying the ice blue and copper chronomat, the green navy, the burgundy premier, all great options. Lloyd Kerr saying, hey Tim, made it in time from Maryland. All of my live viewers, let me say how much I love you guys. You are the reason I continue to do this at 5 p.m. U.S. Eastern when YouTube views fall off a cliff. If this were all about views, every episode would be about Rolex and it would go live at like 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning. You are the reason this show is here. What else is going on? We have Cramerica Heavy Industries, I love the reference, saying Breitling has really stepped up that they have. Enrique Cassiano saying, as far as I know, all Navitimers are in-house now. I'm not totally sure about that. There's definitely non-in-house inventory out there at Breitling stores. Uh, but I would have to double check that to confirm. Somehow I have trouble believing they would let go of the 7750 and the modular chronographs altogether, but we can definitely check that. Blake Taylor saying, you the man, Tim, from, well, thank you very much. From cyberspace comes Blake, and from Will Charlesworth in London, one of my staying up late viewers out in the UK, the Middle East, and continental Europe. Mark S. saying, Tim, we love the live show, and it's not going anywhere, guys. You won this battle. It's going to stay live. And then we have Will Charlesworth saying, always a fan of Breitling with real aviation heritage. That's a fact, and I'll tell you this about those weird circular slide rules. It seems quaint, but when you go to see how U.S. Naval Aviators, which is Navy, Coast Guard, and Marine Corps, when you look at how they're actually trained, they actually use circular slide rules in their training. It's not something they would ever use in service, but they have to prove they know how to use it. And if you watch my review videos, you will too. All right, let's jump back into our regularly scheduled program. You asked, I answered in the chat box, and now on your screen, Rolex Oyster Perpetual 39. You had to know that this was coming because this is the ultimate example of a watch that is overlooked. When you see what people are paying for the 41, hell, when you see some of the lacquer dial versions of the 36, you wonder where this went and why it's still so accessible. The market for the current 41 millimeter Oyster Perpetual is literally insane. Check that out. And you may have some reservations about spending your $54,861 with a vendor who spells Tiffany Tiffanu, which I find so funu I had to laugh. But the important thing to remember is that the 2015 to 2020 OP39 is objectively quite rare. And when you start segmenting all the different dial variants that were available, you realize that any given one of them is scarcer still. So, the market for these is quite reasonable, especially given the scarcity. White grape, red grape, dark rhodium, blue, black, silver, you've got options here. And unlike, say, the fifty to $60,000 turquoise 41s, the 39s are not a bubble market destined for imminent bloodletting. You see prices like that, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, and you think quantitative easing was here. Those turquoise dials are not going to last at that price. But if you go out and you pay market price for an OP39 in red grape, let's say you pay $8,500, you're not going to see a bloodletting down the line. If it loses any value in the short term, it'll be a few hundred, maybe a thousand bucks. And in the long run, you can't lose. It's a gorgeous watch, a rare watch, a core collection. Remember, in 1933, the first Rolex sports watch, real sports watch in the modern format, and the prototype of the modern watch was the Oyster Perpetual. 
the bubble back, which combined the oyster water-resistant case of 1926 with the perpetual rotor winding system that just launched in the early 30s. Put them together and you get that first oyster perpetual and it has been in the catalog ever since. When asked which watch he wished he had designed, during his lifetime, Gerald Genta said without hesitation, the Rolex Oyster. And now you can have that canonical core collection Rolex for a hell of a lot less than a version that's only two millimeters bigger and still in production, by the way. There aren't many real opportunities to buy something overlooked in contemporary Rolex, because with the internet, everyone knows everything immediately, but this is one of them. We got Kunik from Berlin, well, thank you for staying up late in Central Europe with me. I appreciate that. Asking, where are your sunglasses? I, they're on my desk back in my office. I totally forgot to bring them here, uh, which is one of the downsides of having metal framed glasses. With the old Oakleys, they were super light. They would sit on my head and I would just leave them there. With the metal framed glasses, they're now heavy enough that if I can leave them in a safe, a safe place, I don't worry as much about losing them anymore. And I'll leave them there so they don't mat down my hair. I mean, they really are a lot heavier. And the last thing I need is for them to fall off my head, hit this keyboard, and close YouTube. So that would be the equivalent of a live stream disaster happening in real time. So they're sitting on my desk. We got Brian Elsley from London and Mick in Florida noting that I've matched my coat and my watch today. And indeed I have, you're about to see more about that watch. But first, viewer wrist shots. We have Rick R from the American Midwest with his GOS Norskin Northern Lights Damascus from Patrick Sjogren in Sweden. Derek H soars with his IWC Pilot's Watch Chronograph Lake Tahoe edition en route from Tokyo to Manila. Dan V of Milwaukee relaxes with a brew. Midwestern brews are good. An IWC Big Pilot's Watch Top Gun Mojave Desert Edition. Gotta love that Mojave Desert Sand Ceramic and dial to match. Miguel S. of San Juan flies to Costa Rica as our apparent night of IWC domination continues. Air superiority for the brand from Schaffhausen. And David T. of Fort Worth is ready for anything with his Omega Seamaster Ploprof, the Seamaster 1200 meter at the swimming pool. I would say you're a bit over prepared, but it looks good. Join my team, guys. I've got some news. We are hiring. Here at Watchbox, we are in an expansion mode. Now, we are opening offices around the world, but number one for us is and has always been online sales. The mothership here at Bala Kenwood, the building where I reside, right there, you can see Danny Goffberg, our chairman, Justin Rice, our CEO. You can actually see me and Max Booser down at the bottom, but we are adding folks. And if you check out the careers page on the watchbox.com, you can see exactly where we are hiring watchmakers, sales associates, technical specialists who know web design, all of that. But the biggest one is sales associates, people who can be client advisors, who are conversant in watch, diplomatic, personable, and fun. We're a young company now. I'm 37. I'm one of the oldest folks in any given room. And we like to bring in people who are good cultural matches, who love watches, and can live the watch lifestyle more or less 24 hours a day. Benefits are great. There are many of them. I just got an email about our now improved 401k plan. So getting better every day. Reach out to me, Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. If you think you can be a watch sales associate here for Watchbox, we got health, we got dental, we got 401k and catered lunch every single week. You get three free lunches. It does not get any better in the world of luxury watch sales. So check out our careers page and email me, Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com, if you want to join my team. Okay, 10 watches for under $10,000. My man Salman again. What's he got for us this time? Well, he's got the Tudor Black Bay 58 AG925. Still a blast a year later. This will be remembered as one of the best Tudor designs of all time. We have sterling silver, we have a taupe dial, and we have a bezel insert to match. Everything about this AG925 remains rare in any watch. And that, of course, is the main material, sterling silver. Previously, it was something you saw only very, very, very rarely. This is a watch that was a total blindside. Just when you thought there was nothing new to say about the Tudor Black Bay, 
They come out with a Black Bay 58 that's 12 millimeters thick, 39 millimeters in diameter, and has a sterling reputation among collectors because of its use of an unusual and nearly extinct pre-stainless steel corrosion-free material and taupe, which is uncommon on any watch. Now it's true, before stainless steel, before the arrival of Staybrite in the 1920s and 30s, before Firth Brown brought us stainless steel for watches, uh, for the most part, silver was gonna be your more accessible corrosion-resistant option if you weren't going for some sort of gold or platinum. And Tudor's challenge was to create a version of sterling silver that would not turn your wrist blue. A year later, I can say they were successful. That said, the display case back remains an epic fail. But the good, and a cautionary tale, by the way, do not put a display case back on an actually ugly movement. I understand that people want it, but between Tudor and Oris, you have many good arguments for not showing ugly movements and almost no good arguments in favor. But again, it's on the case back. You don't have to look for it. It's well engineered. The movement is on par with Rolex spec wise and Tudor did not have to create a unique movement for the Black Bay 58, but they did. So even though the case back is superfluous, you can see that the movement is properly sized for the case and not designed for one of the 41 or 43 millimeter Black Bay models, which is genuinely impressive, especially considering the original Black Bay 58 didn't even have a display case back, so there was no way to know. For $4,400, so far it's only offered on a strap. You can get a water resistant strap or you can get the leather you see here. I would love to see a sterling silver bracelet, but it's probably not gonna happen because it would probably double the cost of the watch. What's going on in the box? Cramerica Heavy Industries saying that Tudor display case back is like me wearing a Speedo. I, I, I get the point. <laughs> <laughs> and then right here, we have Chaz from the Berg saying, free food is a big motivator for us chubby guys. You'd be amazed how many non-chubby guys and gals love that free food. When you can order food into the office three days a week, you can easily order from like a place that sends huge proportions of food, and then you just like save what's left over from Monday for Tuesday, and the leftovers from Wednesday for Thursday, and it's like you got free food five days a week for lunch. What else is going on? Mark S. asking, Tim, why would 7 a.m. Eastern Sunday deliver the highest number of live viewers? Not live viewers. Most of the videos I post get more views, I guess for want of a better term, in syndication by people who watch them as streaming on demand. So I know that watching the cyclical flow of volume, the highest volume on my channels is Saturday morning at 7 a.m. and Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Any given weekday, 7 a.m. is the magic number. So if I were to record this and post it, I would post it on the weekend and I would post it at 7 a.m. to get the most views. I do it now at 5 p.m. U.S. Eastern so I can still get some of my European and U.K. audience in and I can get the U.S. audience more or less as they're coming home from work. It's an imperfect compromise to try to get as many of you live as possible, but I take a huge hit in viewership because of it. Now, jumping to my watch, the watch I'm wearing right here, the watch that I first discovered at Watt, can we go full screen with that? Because this one deserves it. That strap was custom made for me by Dan's guy in in Odessa, Ukraine, and you can see the certificate underneath. A uh, piece unique with my Maso Green, and everything about this watch kicks ass. So this is the Dan Reuter DR02. It is my watch. They're all 42 millimeter stainless steel chronographs. That's what a DR02 is. I first saw it at Watch Time New York and I was blown away by the level of hand finishing that Dan lavishes on the 7750 movement. Like Recep Recepi in his early days, Dan buys basic ETA calibers, in this case the 7750, and delivers them fully finished, satinated, striped, black polished, media blasted, beveled, all of that, and six position adjusted to keep chronometer level time. When you get the watch, he gives you the timing certificate to show you that it's running better than chronometer in six positions, not the chronometer five. And I can confirm from personal experience, this watch has been gaining less than a second a day over the month I've owned it. Look at the engraving on the rotor. That's done by Artur Akmeyev, who does all the engravings on the Dan Reuter watches. And this one has my name engraved 
under the company name. And again, Artur did that. He is one of the foremost engravers in the world, works out of California, and he works at very low volume on an artisanal basis. So this is a hand finished movement, hand adjusted and hand engraved. And this is a watch that is far beyond the level of finish and customization you will get almost anywhere else for less than $5,000. That's right. The watch retails for $4,995. Dan makes under 100 watches per year. And like I said, they are highly customizable. And you can even get things like this green dial with yellow hands, or you can get a custom colored strap with a contrasting stitch, or you can get engraving on the case back, or if you've got a favorite number, you can get that series number. There are a huge number of options, including whether you want the movement to be silvered, rose, or yellow gold gilded. And there you can see my watch going together. Dan actually mixes the lacquers to create the colors. And since we wanted to do a watch that paid tribute to his Ukrainian heritage, we went with the Maso green, first because it's my standard color, and I do that green, but also because he made it using yellow and blue with emphasis on the yellow to make it a lighter green, but that's where we got the idea to make it a very subtle Ukrainian tribute. And it's a royal blue dial. That's a standard option that he offers. Any of you guys could get the Tim Maso if you wanted it. Uh, it's really cool. A fully engine turned dial with polished hands is coming. That was entirely turned on a lathe, and then Dan media blasted the center. He fire blued the hands, and then he polished off the center to create a mirrored center with a blued end. Even Kerry Voudelainen uses multiple parts put together to achieve that effect. That's the quality of what you're getting. I can't say enough good things about Dan's watches. He's been known to give out lifetime warranties like he did on mine, and strap options exist at Reuter. Mine was custom, of course. Uh, you could get that if you want. It's Gator on both sides like a freaking FP Journe. Dan's a cool guy to know as well. If you haven't checked out the Tim Masso podcast, check it out. You can find it on all major podcast formats. Uh, one of my last two podcasts, if you go on Google Podcasts, uh, Spotify, or iTunes, you can find my podcast with Dan, where he talks about how he taught himself watchmaking. He went to school for marketing. He taught himself finishing. He taught himself regulation. He taught himself repair. All of that, he's kind of like... He's kind of like the watch fan from the internet who made good in the industry. He's living the dream. Definitely consider that for under five grand. Richard Combs, our man from South Florida, saying, great bespoke piece. Pictures are beautiful. Congrats and well-deserved, my friend. I am super lucky to have this watch. And I can't tell you how much fun it is to have a watch that everyone compliments for looking great, but no one's ever heard of. It's the opposite of a Rolex where people know what it is because the, everyone knows Rolex, but they know nothing about the model. Here, people know that they love it, but they don't know the brand. Whereas with Rolex, people love the brand, but they know nothing about the model. What else is going on? But, uh, Enrique Cassiano saying 7750, the best chronograph movement ever made in my opinion. I owned one in my old Zinn EZM 1.1 for four years. It was tank tough, a great timekeeper. And I can tell you, learning watchmaking myself, you learn a lot from a 7750 because there's so much to it. You've got a calendar module on one side, an automatic module on the other side, and then you've got traditional lateral clutch chronograph sandwiched between them. It's a hamburger of a movement, but it is beautifully made and it can be made to run very, very accurately. What else is going on? Norm M saying it's like high-end custom bicycles. I agree. And my, this, this color scheme, the blue and the green, actually came from a custom bike that I'm going to have made. That's where the color actually came from. Right now, you cannot get bike parts. But while I'm waiting for bike parts to become available again, supply chains, uh, I got a watch inspired by the bike that we haven't built yet. Okay, Sartori Biard SB04, another artisanal, low volume, customizable piece. This one made in France by Armand Biard, who is an absolutely giant human being. I saw him at a watch show and I'd actually done a video podcast with him. I didn't recognize him in person because he was half a foot taller than I was and I didn't realize he was that tall. So anyway, he does all the work on the dial furniture, the hands, the chapter ring, the dial is engine turned. He has many different dial options. The watch, the SB04 was his breakthrough model. By trade, he is an industrial designer who has taught himself component finishing and fabrication. The watch is 40 millimeters in diameter in stainless steel or titanium, 11.5 millimeters thick. Now you have hand finished exteriors, hand finished dials, all customized and made in France where Armand is based. 
fired and guilloche dials are offered so you can get either one, but so are meteorite dials. Note he also fired the dial furniture here. Stone dials like malachite are available, and so is aventurine glass, and they all look great. Take note there, that custom piece uses Eastern Arabic numerals. Dial furniture can be custom cut, polished, or fired for color, and there's even a very 2022 green available on top of a lovely rose lathe guilloche. All impressive stuff. He does much of the work himself, which is why delivery time is six months, but you get what you pay for, and you will get a unique, fully customized watch from a guy who is an absolute knight, a very cool dude, and a very nice human being. He uses an STP313 Swiss movement. It's basically STP's version of a 2A 24, but upgraded with six hours of extra power reserve for 44 total. Prices range from 3,000 to 4,000 depending on options, and it will be worth both the price and the weight involved. Okay, viewer wrist shots number three. Your watch on my box, starting with Armin R showcasing his Corum Bubble 47 Skull limited edition with a favorite beverage. Jonathan Z and his watch box bought Date Just 2 head to a wedding in LA. Thank you for trusting our company. Ken O and Rex the Collie, we love our watches and whiskers. Join us in mutual appreciation of his Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter, looking good. Will C appreciates the English countryside in the spring with his Rolex Explorer on a Zealand rubber strap. That is a gorgeous combination. Bogdan I and his cycling socks will be on time for the ride with his Tudor Black Bay. Send your wrist shots to mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com. Let's see what's going on in the box. Jim Millett saying, importing watches from the U.S., how difficult, costly. I forget, Jim, where are you? Are you in Britain? Let me know. What else is going on in the box? We have Waffle on Watches saying, I thought purple was, next to be, was supposed to be the next in color. It might be too niche. It might be a little too niche. I thought that would happen too, but I think in the end it's going to be too narrowly appealing. Mark S. saying, Tim, you're getting a new Bill Holland. That is correct. I will get the Bill Holland carbon fiber frame. I've got the Exagrid right now. But I will get the carbon fiber Bill Holland as soon as you can once again buy Shimano Dura Ace as though this were a first world country. So when they're available, I'm going to give Bill and Cody a call and I'm going to order up a new bike and wait for however long it takes, because with Bill, it is always worth the wait. NATO Steve saying, your watch on my box sounds like prison talk. Well, we're a little bit crazy here. This is the asylum after all. It's not quite a prison, but it's definitely an, an insane asylum. This is an institution, and I am the chief orderly. Actually, I'm probably the chief inmate now that I think of it. 10 watches for under $10,000. Okay, this is brand new, just launched. Salman would love it. It is the Longines Ultracron. This is not quite a vintage reissue. As you can see, they didn't go overboard with Fotina here or vintage accents. This is a modern take on the caliber 430 and 431 1968 Ultracron divers from Longines. This one is brand new, but it will be familiar to vintage fans. Longines has one of the top historical departments and archives in the business. They have an archival staff and they leverage it heavily. They've been doing vintage inspired watches since the 80s when vintage inspired wrist watches were considered to be toxic. No one wanted anything old back then. Longines was way ahead of the curve with the Longines Lindbergh re-edition back in the 80s. So continuing with that thread, this is not quite as vintagey as the Longines Legend Diver, but it brings back the best of the old watch. Now, full bracelet, this watch recalls the 68, which had a beat rate of 36,000 vibrations per hour or 5 hertz like a Zenith El Primero. That was a professional dive watch from the last few years of mech dominant watchmaking before the quartz revolution. This Longines has exceptional dial detail. Look carefully and you can see it's beautifully, it's beautifully grained with a pebbly texture. It's all applique and upscale. It has a sapphire capped and fully loomed bezel like a Blanc Pan 50 fathoms. The bracelet on this 43 millimeter, 300 meter diver comes with an extra NATO strap and tools. So you've got the 43, it dives to 300, it comes with this NATO strap, and you get a tool to swap between the bracelet and the strap. The movement is an ETA modified to run at 36,000 vibrations per hour, and in spite of that, it still has a pretty robust 52 hour power reserve like, well, 
the old El Primero caliber 400. Each one is also a time-lab certified chronometer. And you, you can see right here a time-lab certificate for one of the watches. It is very impressive. If you're wondering how this compares to COSC, well, time-lab, which also does the Geneva Hallmark certification, is a bit more comprehensive, but fundamentally uses the same ISO 3159 timing standards as the COSC. So you know what you're getting, and it's a high standard. Pricing is $3,500 to just get it on the leather strap, $3,700 to get it on the bracelet with the NATO, with the strap tool. And for an extra 200 bucks, I can't imagine why you wouldn't. This is a cool watch. This is a fascinating option at, well, frankly, about a third the price of a used 50 Fathoms 5015 and probably just as appealing and functional when it's on your wrist. Now, Bremont, this is a brand that's a bit controversial. Their in-house caliber, which was La Joux Pere built for Bremont, kind of rubbed people the wrong way when they took too much credit for it. But I've met the brothers Nick and Giles English, and they're genuinely cool guys who love machines, especially watches. And along with George Bamford, you can realize just how much watch nerd pa patrimony there is in this Bremont S500 Bamford edition. George Bamford of Bamford Watch Department does custom versions of watches. The English brothers do watches that pay homage to various forms of British history. In this case, the Supermarine line, named after the constructor of record-breaking seaplanes in the 30s, who later built the Supermarine Spitfire fighter of World War II. Well, this is all blacked out. It is a California dial. It is a dive watch from a brand probably better known for pilot's watches. Uh, the watch has blue luminova that they call California blue, and it's beautifully rendered in contrast to the black. Take note, the loom is sensational, absolutely no shortfalls here, and the look belies the $4,995 price. Added value comes in a few forms. DLC steel, now DLC is pointless if it sits on top of soft steel. Well, they've hardened the steel under the DLC so that it doesn't collapse underneath the DLC and cause the DLC to fracture. There is a shock absorber mount for the movement, so it has a rubber annular movement spacer rather than the typical metal movement spacer to brace against big shocks. So not only is it 500 meters water resistant with a helium escape valve, it is also very, very shock tolerant by design. Each one is also a certified chronometer. It has an all black look that is superb alongside the California accents. And it has a no date dial that is for me a highlight because it brings beautiful balance. Ceramic bezel insert, the movement is an SW200 in chronometer spec and it is far more interesting for the price than, say, a Breitling Super Ocean with the same movement would be. Okay, it's also built in London, which carries some value in an era when genuine British watchmaking at this price is rare. Viewer wrist shots number four, MS Musna N, by that I mean Miss Musna N, a rare lady friend of our program, with her ladies Certina Diver at the Nature Preserve in Kenya with zebra in the background out in the wild. Jason C. is out on the town with his Glasuta Original Panamatic Lunar and some refreshments. A recurring theme tonight, JCS captures a colorful shot of his rare Panerai Luminor Marina PAM 120. We have Walt M. driving and wearing Porsche design. Is that guards red I see on that dial? And Andrew H. takes us home with his Grand Seiko Spring Drive, Miller High Life, and Anime. Looking good, my friend. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Time out, Tim out. Thank you for watching our program. Thank you for Sean making it happen, including that slick intro. If you're tuning in late, rewind, check it out. Time out, Tim out. Thanks for joining. Be well, have fun. Thanks for logging on.